Okay, everybody, welcome back. Let's get started. This is the first official computer graphics lecture. If you were here last week, we did an introduction to the course. In fact, I think I see the same people here. It's going to be a small class, which is nice. Um, and uh, we didn't really cover anything, but I did mention a few things, and I uh, just wanted to clarify a couple of things that I mentioned. Um, this is the behacker.com website. The, my clarification I wanted to make is I haven't gotten around to putting up the assignments yet. So the assignments aren't available yet. In fact, at my lunch break today, I made sure that they weren't available by taking them out. So under the assignments link here, if you click on them, it's going to say not found. I'm changing the assignments. They're not going to be programming related. They're going to be concept related, probably most like writing assignments. So no programming for this course. <laughs> So if you freaked out and you've already looked at which I think is half, that's why we have such a small class. People freaked out. They looked at those assignments and went, oh my god, I can't do any of that. Don't worry about it. You don't have to. So you guys have the inside scoop here. There will, there will be five assignments, but I haven't put them up there yet. I have a workshop this weekend I've been trying to prepare for. So, In fact, uh, not a bad time to plug the workshop. If you're not uh, doing anything on Saturday, um, if you're digital arts students, you might appreciate the workshop. Um, it's from 10 o'clock in the morning till I don't know, 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. There's pizza, free pizza at noon. Um, what is the workshop on? It's um, app development on the Android and on the iPhone platforms for non-programmers. So it's for web developers, actually. So if you have any web development or design skills in terms of, that's why I said some digital arts people generally have some web experience, usually. If not, you'll end up learning some about it. But it's taking a website and turning it into an app, and making it work as a native iPhone or Android app, and also taking uh, third-party tools. Uh, PhoneGap is one of them that I'll be looking at, as well as uh, JQ Touch, uh, which is a jQuery extension library for components and things. And it's not a technical kind of; it's just an overview survey of techniques with some examples and there will be some sample projects you can download and play around with. Um, all of this stuff is like uh, web development related stuff. So if you're in an HTML CSS class, that's perfect. But you guys might have an interest in it as well. But if you're not taking that class, it doesn't really matter. It's free. You can stop in and get some free pizza at noon. And then, uh, <laughs> if you don't like it, then uh, you can go elsewhere. <laughs> it's supposed to be a nice day. Maybe absorb some rays outside or something if you get bored. So. You know, don't feel obligated to stay because I know. It's going to be a nice day. In fact, I might, I'm kind of regretting having it because <laughs> it's going to be a nice day. <laughs> it's supposed to be like Indian summer. So it's warm, like in the 90s. Yeah, It's like the last bit of summer before the fall really starts. Okay, enough chit-chat. Uh, the other reason why I'm here is to show you that we have the fall 2012 videos on the site as well. If you missed last week's lecture or you want to revisit it, you can click on the link. It'll take you to a YouTube website. And the YouTube website right here will give you lecture number one. So, And then uh, today's lecture will be on here, lecture number two. So if you missed last week, you can go ahead and see what you missed. Or if you happen to miss a class in the future, this is where it's located. I just put this up as well. So stay tuned. Um, preferably within the next couple weeks, I'll have the assignment set. Nothing's due yet, so you don't have to worry about it. All right. So lecture number one, after we get done with the administrative part, let's start the lecture. Lecture one is pretty easy. It's just going to be an overview of what is computer graphics. Um, so I'm going to go through today. I'm going to go through a lot of terminology with you, and then we're going to have a little orientation to OpenGL as a concept with no programming, mm -hmm. just so you can get a feel for what it's all about. Uh, because what I'm going to do is also cover a couple of other packages as well. You don't have to worry about the programming part of it, but uh, it's nice to know what it is actually in concept. So what is computer graphics? So in this lecture, we're going to explore what computer graphics is all about. This is actually labeled lecture one. And as I go through the lectures, there's like 50 or 60 of them. I don't go all of them. I'm only going to cover a couple of them. I mean, a couple of them. I'm only going to cover about 30 of them, maybe half of them. So, uh, But this is one, number one if you're looking for it. Um, so what it is we're looking at in terms of a survey of some of the application areas of computer graphics, how it fits in. It's best to describe it first from a historical perspective and then also from a current perspective to sort of see what we're talking about. When we talk about the study of computer graphics, it deals with aspects of creating images with a computer. It's a definition, good definition for you. It's creating images with a computer. 
hardware, software, applications, all sorts of different things uh, fall into that category. So computer graphics, kind of a broad subject area. Um, however, it does, you know, it does lend itself quite well in, in terms of cross disciplines, like digital arts people can study um, computer graphics and they're more primarily going to be interested in rendering concepts probably and light and all of the basic foundational stuff. Animation game players and stuff like that, excuse me, game players are interested in animation techniques which falls under computer graphics. Um, there's movie, movie makers, there's computer program makers, stuff like that. People make API, so it all falls into the same category. Here's an example. Where did this image come from? Hmm, don't know. What hardware, software did we need to produce it? This image is actually out of the standard OpenGL libraries. It doesn't exist. <laughs> it looks like it does. It's a picture, right? Yeah. We didn't take a picture and scan it in the computer and put it on my slide. That's not what happened. This was actually out of an OpenGL program written in C and C++. Actually, it was written in C, not C++. So, but it looks pretty real, right? So most of computer graphics is an illustrative per point here, is making real out of something that's fake. You know, taking and writing a program, writing some lines, and not necessarily a program, sometimes it's playing with a higher level API, um, and creating, it's kind of like an HTML document if you think about it. When you look at, you know, a, a website, what is it? It's really just text. <laughs> parsed by a browser and displayed to you on the screen. Well, that's what this is. This is text, parsed by an interpreter and displayed on the screen. So it's not a picture. So most people, when they think of computer graphics, it's not scanning in images and putting them on the computer. That's something else. <laughs> what that is, I don't know. We're taking a video and taking the video and copying it on the computer. <coughs> There's no rendering, there's no graphic, there's nothing associated with that. You're just basically taking and putting something that's in paper form and making it electronic. It's electronic graphic, but it's not normally what we spend an entire semester talking about is how to scan an image in. That's kind of, that falls in a slightly different category. So our preliminary answer to this question, so I already gave you the answer, it's, it's code. But our preliminary answer might be thinking upon a couple of different angles, which I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, could be from an application perspective, the object is an artist's render, rendering of the sun from an animation to be shown in a doomed environment, planetarium. What does that look like? Yeah, it sort of looks like a, sort of describes that, I guess, a little bit. From a software perspective, Maya, which is what digital arts people generally use, or graphic people, artists, Maya from for modeling and rendering, but Maya is built on top of OpenGL. This is why we're talking about OpenGL in this class. Maya is one of those programs in a digital arts program you're going to use. If you don't use it, it wouldn't be a digital arts program. Or it wouldn't be art at all. It wouldn't be computer anything. <laughs> so Maya is something that is generally found in areas like this. That's a higher level API written on top of OpenGL which is the graphic component. It also gives you other features, animation, timing, speed, I don't personally use Maya on a daily basis. I've seen it, but you know, as an application developer, you know, I'm more interested in the OpenGL component of it. Or from a hardware perspective, the PC with graphics card for modeling and rendering isn't that just a process of a PC, a graphics card, you know, interpreting an image and showing it on a on a on a on an LCD display or on a RGB kind of display or something, or yeah, you know, CRT. Basic graphic system. So when we talk about the graphic system, we can break it down into a couple of different components. And don't don't be afraid. There's some new components on here you may not have seen yet. <laughs> However, uh, it's pretty easy. We know about these input devices. I hope. Well, this is where the scanner might come into place if you were to have a scanner in the component. Normally, a keyboard, a mouse, a tablet, writing, drawing tablet. Could be an other source, because the input source might be from a video feed as well, or from a scanner, or from anything that's providing the input. We have a processing system associated with it. And the processing system is the start of what we would call the graphic pipeline or the processing. So, and I'll go through these terms as we go through the course. The processor is going to be using memory, and then there's going to be this thing called a frame buffer. 
Frame buffer are little pieces of memory that's through the rendering process. We have little pieces of information that we're going to store to a buffer. Because believe it or not, we can't all put it out on the device at one time. It's going through this, and then it's referred to as a pipeline because it's going through a system. It's going from input to some processing to some output on the device here. And we have the image is formed in the frame buffer. All the pieces are put together. So you know, what are the pieces? Well, when we start looking at OpenGL, you start look, you'll start identifying the pieces. And the pieces are going to be, you know, the where is this thing in the plane? <laughs> and I have to talk about the XYZ plane, but where, where is this in the graphic view? What angle are we looking at? So that's one of the components. Number two is like what color, shades, contrasts, uh, physical characteristics are we going to add to this? What is this image to begin with? Where is it in proportion or in relationship to the other images in its, back, in its environment? And uh, lighting, um, all sorts of other different sources of factors that fit into the big picture in terms of how we're going to put together this screen that's going to show this picture on it. A picture in a 3D world has multiple views to it. And so we're only going to show, we're going to put in the frame buffer what, what's needed. When this changes, we can repopulate from the frame buffer that's going to hold all the information that we're concerned with in this image. And that's how we get a rotating object, because we can just go back to the frame buffer, pull it out. And we have to do it quickly, which means we're only going to store the necessary information over here, and we're going to pre-process everything. Store it in a buffer. Think of it sort of like a memory location. Usually it's on the graphics card, or it's on the computer itself. If you're using a third-party application like Maya, as an example, there's going to be a buffer built into that application, and a frame buffer that holds on to all that information, because you have like real-time kind of movement stuff going on. So this is application-dependent. may also be in the old days, old technology, the video RAM was used for it, and it was closely related to the video output. It has to be somewhere close and accessible, because that's, where we're, that's what we're showing on the screen, if we think about it. It's all coming from a buffered information that we sent to it. We can't send it in real time. Real time means no buffer. We process a piece of information, we send it out. Process a piece of information, we send it out. Can't do that. You're like, well, why not? Well, wouldn't it be funny if you turned on the TV set and you say, one little square, two little square, three little square, <laughs> and the screen. Actually, older system populated this way from the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen. You guys are probably not, this would have been a black and white television set from like the 70s-ish. You guys probably have never seen this before, but old systems used to populate that way. You can, actually old computer systems, the first CRTs that came out, had very small or minimal frame buffers. And the picture would just like go like this. You know, you'd see it, you'd see it develop from the top of the screen <laughs> to the bottom of the screen. Or sometimes they switched it, it went from the left to the right and it populated the pixels with the information that was needed to show an R, a B, or a G, <laughs> red, blue, and green, which was the color combination back then. It still is the basis of the color combination. And we have three lights that project through a tube, and each one of those pixels get illuminated with a color. And then the screen image itself doesn't miraculously all appear at one time. If you don't have a frame buffer, it appears like, you know, as it's supposed to, as each one of the pieces of information comes through. Frame buffer helps us. So now, thinning immediately appears. Your eye can't catch it. Digital, it appears automatically. Your eyes cannot catch. Or an LCD monitor. And the monitor technology also helped to improve. I'll talk about monitors in a few minutes. But the technology itself has also grown and matured to the point where it's a, it's a lot more workable. <laughs> runs a little bit faster doesn't overheat as much, and we don't have any big old tubes anymore. So just like your TV screens have changed over time, so have computer monitors, the monitor is the monitor, which is kind of interesting because people are starting to see that now. They're like, how come we, can we run the TV on the computer? Well, that's been going on for a long time. Well, recently it's gotten so that your computer is better quality than your TV, depending upon how old your TV is. Uh, because your computer screen is way up to date, and we have, you know, Apple's got the Retina display now, and all clarities. It's basically the quality of the technology that's evolving to improve the sharpness, the contrast, 
the visibility, which is not something half the people don't even see. So as, it, as an example, I can pick up a couple of different monitors, and I don't know, maybe it's my eyes, but I can't tell the difference sometimes. I look at it and go, oh, it looks good, oh, it looks good. Secondly, have you ever gone shopping for a TV set, you know, looking at them all going, which one do I like? Well, they all look the same, right? But they're not all the same. They all have different pixel levels to them, different speeds, different, different size buffers, different memory. So, yeah, I can switch stations faster on this one <laughs> than I can on this one. Or this one's going to throw off heat, and this one's not going to throw off heat. You know, the back of it's not going to get hot. Which we don't have a problem anyway with any of these things. Or this one is a built-in DVR. Usually it's the features these days that people are looking for. Oh, it has picture-in-picture. Picture. Oh, it doesn't have picture-in-picture. Picture. Oh, it has, you know, all these things. As a consumer, we don't really think about, not normally think about the technology. Um, but it is part of the graphic component. You're only as good as your, your CTR, essentially, or your LCD, or whatever it is you're projecting on. If you have a really good quality image and you put it on a poor quality display, it's a poor quality image. And if it is a poor quality image, don't render it as a high quality engine uh, image, which is ridiculous because people used to take in the beginning the Blu-ray discs, you know, and HD TV, HD, you know, quality v DVD, and run it on a regular old tube system. You might as well just get a VCR tape if that's the case. Because so as it ends up happening, the consumers, consumers, companies love it, consumers hate it. Because every year they get it, oh, you know what? Now they got this. Well, now they got that. And now you got to upgrade to keep up. And if you don't upgrade everything, just one component, and yeah, you lose it. You don't get the full effect. So go out and spend money. That's what we come to say. Spend money. You're American. Spend money. <laughs> so, all right. The CTR. So we're just going to go down memory lane here. This is a cathedral ray tube, but you don't really need to know that. Most people just call it a CR, excuse me, CRT. I'm dyslexic. CTR. CRT. <laughs> cathedral, whatever. I can never say that word either. Ray tube. <laughs> tubes. Tube technology. Remember tubes? No, nobody remembers tubes. You guys grew up on LCDs probably. So, can be used either as a line drawing device and I'm terrible at pronunciation, so I'll just let you read that word to yourself. And, you know, and English is my first language, but I can't pronounce anything. There's a side story on that, but I won't waste your video time. I won't waste the class time on that. Well, okay, slightly, just because I mentioned it. When I grew up in the States, and when they taught me how to read, it was by sight, not by phonics. I don't know why. They were experimenting with my group, I guess. So it took me till high school before I actually learned what phonics was. <laughs> so when I look at this word, I have to pre-process it before I try to pronounce it. Because I don't go calligraphic, calligraphic. I can't do that unless I purposely do that, and I'm really terrible at it. Although years of practice, I have become a lot better. So like little words I can pick up, but if we memorized can be used. Instead of going used, <laughs> which is the phonic technique. Yeah, anyway, long story short, that's why I can't, that's why Johnny can't read. Barbara can't read. <laughs> so, any of you don't didn't grow up in the stage, you probably didn't get that joke either. It's, why can't Johnny read? It, okay, so we had literacy issues in the United States for a long time, and so one of the biggest commercials was, why can't Johnny read? <laughs> so I said, that's why Johnny can't read. It's a joke. It's an old joke. <laughs> it meant because our school system's failing, but you know, you turn on the TV now, what do you hear? California school systems still failing. Nothing's changed <laughs> since I graduated. <laughs> We're still last on the list. Okay. <laughs> Back to computer graphics. Okay, so, um, and this time you've had a chance, hopefully, to reflect on the image that you've been staring at, maybe. Who knows? We have an electron gun. The gun shoots bullets. No, it'd kill all the audience. It shoots rays of lights. So out of the gun comes a light ray, and the light ray projects an RGB scale, which gives us our color combos into a focus lens. We have a Y deflect and an X deflect, which is part of the components, and then we go out and it illuminates a phosphorus tube. It basically sends light signals through and illuminates a, well actually if you've ever seen a tube, it looks like a light bulb in a lot of ways. Uh, but what were they? They have a limited lifespan to them. <laughs> when tube goes, the whole thing goes, <laughs> because 
then you can't get it all illuminated correctly. It's old technology. It was the original technology, very old. It worked with a line drawing device, which basically took and created images with lines, which is what line drawing is about. So you think if you ever looked at these graphic packages and said, all these options, do we have line drawing image or do we have color image or, you know, it depends on how they're describing the quality of it. But imagine if you were just to take a pen and draw lines like an artist would to paint, to, to draw stuff. That's the line drawing, believe it or not. It, gra it paints the images by populating lines um, in, in a particular order depending upon the algorithm that's associated with it. Or it's used to display content of frame buffer or raster mode. Raster mode is using frame buffer content, as I mentioned before, to accumulate all the information and then stuff it out there. <laughs> so we're not drawing it line by line. Instead, we're using an algorithm. and You don't have to worry about these algorithms. If you were developing a graphics card, if you were developing a frame buffer software, if you were, if you were writing Maya, you'd have to come up with an algorithm to basically do all this stuff um, to, to, in order to to do it. That's not the purpose of this class. This class is the purpose of understanding the behind the scenes kind of thing. So that would be a uh, doctorate level slash uh, computer science graphic class. Even uh, advanced. That would be advanced computer graphics actually. Figuring out the algorithms. The algorithms are pretty hectic. I'll look at some algorithms in this course in concept. You don't have to write it. I don't know any algorithms. So. But I will talk about raster mode in a few minutes. Um, so it's using the frame buffer. It's really referred to as raster versus line drawing. Colographic, colographic, whatever. Anyway, la la la. 1950s and 1960s. The history of this. Computer graphics goes back to the earliest days of uh, charts, strip, stripe, strip charts, pen plotters, the simple displays <laughs> using AD converters to go from computer to CRT cost of a refresh of a CRT is way too high. Yeah. This cost? Okay, so when it says cost, it means time. The time to refresh this, way too long. And every time you refresh it, the hotter everything gets. You've got a gun pro projecting a ray on an electrical device that has to accept it, well, through a magnetic, excuse me, through an electronic current that's heating up that's illuminating uh, phosphorus content in a bulb out here. <coughs> it's all heat, really. That's why those TVs got so hot in the old day. In fact, <laughs> old monitors got so hot. So you left the monitor on, the whole thing would burn out. In fact, even the top of the monitor casing when they used to do them in white, they used to turn yellow. And whoa, whoa, and they're having all these holes and stuff. And the longer, the more times you refresh it, the longer you refresh it, the hotter the system gets. So not so efficient. So the cost is too high. Cost in terms of efficiency, also in burnout of parts and stuff. Computers are slow. It makes computers slow. Compute, computers slow. Expensive, unreliable. Makes it very unreliable in terms of the, of the cost. So computer graphics from the 1960s to the 1970s, not so long ago, we had wireframe graphics. Draw only the lines. And that makes sense, because then or if we're painting lines, we draw the lines. So have you guys are familiar with the concept of wireframing? Have you done that in graphics yet? Wireframing tools? There's a lot of open source wireframing tools on the market. Maybe I'll bring one in, actually, if I think about it. Where, what do you do? You're going to draw, let's say, for example, this is a good wireframe. This is a wireframe, by the way. This is a good wireframe example. And this is of the original picture that you looked at. So we want to create this on a computer. So we have tools, software tools that do wireframing, where you're constantly drawing lines. This one is not typical. Eh, it is typical, and then it isn't typical. Some of the tools would have you start. See, these lines are going um, from one end to the other end of the object, which has a benefit to it. Some other would actually have you do triangles in here, polygons, and then uh, you'd fill in the polygons this way, and so there wouldn't be a direct connection from the top to the bottom. Why do you wireframe? Well, you wireframe because you define the components of the image in terms of polygons, and then you apply techniques to the polygons 
And you, you could take this, for example, if this were done with, not this way, not with the lines, but if it were done with a series of polygons that were separated, we could poke a hole in this sucker. We could punch one in. We could make, we can depress it. Hard to depress this. If we depress this, we'd be depressing the entire, we would have to do the whole side is connected. If we depressed a little bit here, we could put like a little rounded hole in here if we wanted to. Why do we want to do that? Well, maybe our image is going to need one. We can also, the, the tighter this is, the more clarity in the image. The fewer polygons, the more line oriented, the more unnatural, unreal, uh, the more computer looking. Because you can't show the same level of detail. What kind of level of detail am I talking about? Well, we can paint the surface of this object polygon by polygon. <laughs> and if we do that, we can fill it in. If we don't have that many polygons, or the polygons are in this really odd order that they're in, it's going to determine how the shading... In fact, if we go back, now that you've looked at this for a few minutes, go back and uh, look at this. We don't have that much detail. We have this guy on the top. We have this, you know, this darkness on the bottom with these two squiggly little things, right? And we got one, two, and we got the little top. We can see that the light, we have pinpoint light. I'm going to talk about light today as well. We have pinpoint, we have ambient light going on in this picture. But we don't have that much color. Well, we have a little bit. We can see the color contrast a little bit. We could get a lot more shininess on this. We can get a lot more detail if we change the wireframing technique. This is a very old primitive kind of wireframing technique used in here. So this picture here is, yeah, it's wireframing. Uh, but it's not, in fact, this is not even identical now that I'm looking at this again because these guys, I didn't see the, I didn't see these two squigglies here. This is kind of a makeshift wireframe. Um, if you, it's possible that they're on the backside. Yes, excellent point, actually. Um, they might be on the backside. Well, I'm looking at a two-dimensional, three-dimensional object. <laughs> this is a three-dimensional object, and I'm looking at it in a 2D picture. So I'm missing, it's all flat squished together. So, yeah, actually, though, I don't think it's exactly the same because I see these two guys. Out. Let me take another look at Rex real quick here. Oops. Mm, it is. It is the same. Because you see this light over here, but it's, it's, not, it's, not the full, it's not the full light of this here, of this, of this round piece here. But there's another circle inside of it. Yeah, this is the light source coming in. So we can ray in, we, we can apply something to this set of polygons. We can apply something to this set, to this set, to that set, or to the whole set. It's called, uh, well, there's a couple of different words for it, depending upon the algorithm that you're using and the technique that you're using. The wireframe is the outline of the image that you're creating. A car, you know, in this, this little container thing, whatever this is, you know, this little bulb thing. And uh, we apply things to the wireframe to give it personality or to give it characteristics. So, um, you know, we can all wireframe humans. We have this skeletal s system right there, and then we put stuff on top of it and layer it. So it's kind of like the same as wireframe, if you think about it. We add different things to it. So. But the more detail, long story short, the more detail you put in, like for example, the more detail here, then the more detail you're going to get in the finished result. Also plays a part in animation. If you wireframed a hand, and you did it all, I don't have a hand picture here, but if you did it all in one shot, and you had lines going this way on the hand, hardly very much bend capabilities, fewer joints. So the more you detail out the image in terms of its components, and the more you frame the individual pieces, and the more detail you provide, and the more number of polygons you put in a particular place, the more contrasting color shading um, effects and animation that you can do on the object. A image that you scan in from the computer does not have any wireframes on it. So there's programs out there, which is kind of interesting. There's a couple programs on the market. I don't know how much they cost. I haven't looked at them in years, but you scan an image into the computer, then you wireframe it, which is backwards. <laughs> so traditionally, you wireframe it, and then you populate it out with color, and so you cut, you put, you you put a something on top of it, 
and you turn it into the picture. So here you take a scanned image and you go backwards to wireframe it, you do and then you go forwards again and apply the original image onto the wireframe. And then you could make that picture move. If there's a picture of a of a person, then you could possibly move the arms up and down. You can animate the person. It's done for animation techniques and for 3D. To take a 2D picture, make it 3D. <coughs> so the software fills it in for you. Fills in the back of the picture. <coughs> you scan a picture into your computer, you only have one view of the picture. <laughs> Wireframing helps you make it into a 3D image for multiple views. Because it will fill in and, it, and the, the software thinks for you. Once you wireframe it, then it goes, oh, that's what you look like, so the back should be the opposite. And we'll fill in the detail. It knows what the algorithms are doing in those programs. Also referred to as sketch padding, also popular between the 1960s and 70s, display processors, storage tube. Yeah, to put the buffer. It's a basic primitive buffer kind of thing where you stored stuff in it. So here's a wireframe representation of sun object. Hmm, wireframe representation, okay. Sketchpad. Sketchpad. I even Sutherland's PhD thesis at MIT. So I'm a really smart math guy. In fact, computer graphics traditionally is completely math based. Mathematicians came out with most of these concepts, by the way, which is kind of interesting. Not artists, <laughs> mathematicians. You think it'd be the opposite artist people. <laughs> so, recognize the potential for man machine interaction. So, it came out with a loop. And so, we have a graphic loop or state machine. So, OpenGL runs on a concept of what's called a state machine. A state machine is an endless loop that runs, that projects an image or puts up a scene. And in the entire program just runs with that picture. And then you can, in the state machine, you can put a rotation. So every time it loops through, it moves to the right, moves to the right, moves to the right. And then we can have a spinning ball, or we can have a rotating object. And that's primitive kind of state machine sort of application interfaces. And then we, uh, what we do with the loop is we display something, and then the user moves, maybe lose, move, <coughs> moves a light pen or something, or an object. And then the computer generates the new display. So the computer's the application is constantly repopulating the display. So Sutherland also created many other now common algorithms for computer graphics. So that mathematical base on those algorithms is all for computer graphics. So the display processor. So what do we got here? Rather than uh, have the host computer try to refresh display using a specific uh, a special purpose computer called a display processor, a DPU. Graphics are now stored in, in a display list or a display file on the display processor. So basically on a display, pro which was, uh, started out in the late 1970s, another technique to supplement the buffer concept to create a list <coughs> or to create, store the information and then use the information more readily. Because the process, or one of the key problems with computer graphics is speed. Getting that image to render. Speed and functionality. Getting it to where, and there's a compromise generally between the two. The more functionality, the slower. And you can see this in today's games and, and computer um, heavily graphic applications and stuff. And uh, the cure for it all is to add more memory, usually. <laughs> but memory, you can only add memory to a certain point. And then it's the algorithms and it's the processing system that's going to have a part. So what do we mean by host and CRT? Well, the host is the computer. It's what's give, it's hosting the image up. So it's the processor, the CPU, that's going through a display processor, a GPU nowadays, instead of a display processor, which is a DPU. The concept has changed a bit over the years. And now we have a display list that gets sent to the the display processor that goes to the CRT, CTR. Yeah, so that, I said it right, CRT. <laughs> I was going to say it backwards again. All right, so what does this mean? So instead of describing what's on here, because it's all changed a little bit, I'll describe modern day technology. Modern day technology, the more expensive computers have a GPU, not a C. Well, it has a CPU. Central processing system works on the motherboard, CPU. And it processes all the data for the computation, works with a math code processor, and works with all the other components. Take an operating systems course or a hardware architecture course if you want to get into the specifics of that. We got smart. We said, well, let's just 
buff well, let's just save up all the calls to the graphics screen and instead of the CPU wasting all of our time doing that, send it to another processor. So we ended up designing an NVIDIA, was one of the best ones still on the market that came up with it, designing special graphic cards. And people are, what do we need a graphic card for? And so it was a special card that we stuck in our desktop models and it had a, another fan on it, made more noise, and it had a GPU graphic processing unit on there. Graphic processing unit is just like a CPU, but all it does is process the graphic information. And then we, got, we slapped, you know, 256, 512. Now I got one gig and two gig on these cards. It's grown a lot. The first NVIDIA card didn't have any memory on it. And then all of a sudden, now we got two gigs on it, <laughs> which is a lot. Nobody needs more than a gig at this point, I think. That's kind of excessive, too. And you're like, well, what do you think? Well, you know, how, do, how do we know? And the first question that comes to mind, I usually have a student ask, how do you know how much memory you need <coughs> Well, probably about 512 is all you need, or 256 is all you need to check email <laughs> or to load your web browser. When is a graphic processor used? Any time you have to do a calculation on any graphic component that's going to be displayed on that screen. It doesn't matter what kind of screen these days. We all have LCDs now um, and different technologies coming out soon. But it's the processing that needs to be done to formulate the image. Well... Outside of, and okay, so I mentioned before, taking a, um, taking a picture, scanning it in, yeah, it takes longer. Why? Because there's more information. So to display graphic on the screen, let's talk about Windows right now, or Mac OS X. It's a GUI, GUI UI, GUI, GUI user interface, all graphic. So we didn't start thinking about graphics cards until we ended up with Microsoft, <laughs> with GUI. The GUI is just more pixels that need to be populated, more information that's changing more data. So we send it to a GPU. Eh, actually, the CPU can handle all that stuff. It can't handle CAD programs. We have uh, or Maya, actually, is very graphic intense uh, because it's storing a lot of information about what you are processing and what you're working with in this application. So right now it's application-based. What are you using the computer for? So the more graphic memory you have, not always the better if you're not using it. The GPU doesn't get used at all unless you have to render something. The graphic memory will never be used at all unless you have something too big to fit in the regular memory. So it's kind of a compromise. So what a lot of companies did a couple, five, five years ago, said, okay, let's just forget the graphic card. We don't need it. Gaming, gaming computers need it gaming computers benefit from it. But average user who's using an email program, a Microsoft Word, a Firefox, you don't need a graphics card. Cheap. You don't buy a computer with low. But here's the deal. So they said, well, okay, the notebook computers are not going to put a graphic card. Instead, they're going to mount it. Actually, they're going to share. Some of the more expensive computers have a GPU on the motherboard. The cheaper models, no graphic, no GPU. And not only that, but no memory, no dedicated memory. So you look on the side of the box and it says shared video RAM. Anytime you see the word shared on there, it means there's no video <laughs> RAM. <laughs> it's, when it needs the video RAM, it's going to take from your RAM, from your regular RAM. There's no dedicated video RAM. That means don't use this computer for gaming. Don't, use the, don't put a DVD in this computer and expect it to show like your TV. Not going to work the same way because you're sharing it with the main motherboard. You don't have as much memory available to you. You don't have a separate GPU. So what does that mean? It flickers. It stops. So if you get a really old computer, stick a high definition if it'll work in the, in the drive, run the DVD, it will go stop, the drive will spin, the image will show up, and then it'll stop, and then it'll start again, and then it'll stop. Well, that's the, that's the graphic processing bottleneck. It can only run as fast as the graphic processing can occur. It can't put it out there on the screen fast enough in real time. So that's why, in fact, if you're buying another computer, take a DVD with you, stick the DVD in the drive over at Fry's, run the DVD. See how fast it runs, actually. Because that's telling you how well the system is graphically capable of processing that information. Do you have a question or are you just stretching? OK. That's a good test of a new computer, especially if you're going to take the computer on the airplane with you. So. Most manufacturers know this already. Modern day computers, if you have bought one in the last couple of years, they have enough on there now. 
Because now all these systems have like four gigs of RAM on there. They take one gig and they dedicate it. So you really only have three gigs for your system. You don't need three gigs for email and for web browsing. And you have one gig dedicated to the graphic processing. But the, pro the, cross the graphic processing is still shared. So you put that DVD in there. Most people, most okay, so it's tricky. Most manufacturers of DVD programs will put it in full screen first. So you take the DVD, put it in, whew, full screen. They don't want you to use the computer. <laughs> no longer a computer. Everything else is kind of shut down because that's taking up all your graph. That's taking up your CPU power. You minimize the little screen. You put it up in the corner. Great. You know what happened with that? Less graphic display. It's less amount of information going through here. It's smaller. <laughs> First of all, it's smaller. Second of all, there's not as much detail. He lowered the resolution. He lowered the pixels on it. So you don't have as much data coming through it. Now we can process it. And now we'll let you. So the, you'll never be able to full, keep it in full screen and flip back. You always minimize it, and it gets real small. And so companies are able, they'll, they'll find how big can we make it in the reduced, you know, when we minimize it, how big can we make it so that it still runs okay with other stuff that's running on the computer? So the screen only gets so big. <laughs> and then you have to flip it into full screen mode. It's optimized for your processing power. Well, for the average processing power, your computer might be able to handle something and somebody else's can't. So, long story short, it's all about stuffing data through a through a chant through a rendering cycle, and having enough resources to process it and to store it and to populate some pixels on a screen. So, so the host complies display lists and sends it to the DPU. Which, uh, and here are stones for display processor. Yeah, it's called graphic GPU these days is what we're referring to. Direct view storage tubes. Old. Not used anymore. Created by Tektronics. Tektronics, so I can say that. Do not require the constant refresh. Instead, it stores it up. Makes it readily available. Standard interface to computers. Allowed for standard software. Plot 3D to and Fortran. Old days, think old, and Fortran's very old as well. Relatively inexpensive, open door to use of computer graphics for CAD community. So this was one of the ways of making it exportable, affordable, and using what pieces in the, it was a it was a band-aid for tube technology. So which is still kind of viable. Now we're going from the seventies to the eighties. We're going we're going through the history by the way, if you haven't figured this out. Now we have raster graphics. Okay, beginning with the graphic standards, IFIPS. <coughs> okay, so we have the European effort, which was the GKS, uh, which became ISO 2D standard. And then we have CORE, which is a, a North America effort. Because you think about the concept, all around the world, everybody's contributing. It's kind of the telecommunications industry, actually, back at the time. In the 1970s and 1980s, telecom grew. Everybody all over the world started experimenting with different technologies and stuff. And we took the best of everything that came out, which is how we do with all technologies when you think about it. In fact, uh, the Japanese technology is a little small little phones, you know, and, you know, and of, course, of course now in, in telecommunication, not to deviate too much on top, off topic, but we still have different standards for every country. <laughs> so, I mean, some of it, especially if you have a T-Mobile kind of, you know, some GMS kind of service is kind of standardized, but some of the other stuff we've had, it's TDMA, CDMA, all this other stuff. I don't know, global use for it. It's all central. And then it makes it more expensive, but, you know, people don't want to give up and just, if you gave up research and just went for one technology that's working, there would be no progress. We would not have, uh, we wouldn't have the mobile devices we have today <laughs> if we did that. So, anyway, long story short, we had efforts in European, efforts in North America, Came out with a 2D ISO 2D standard. Came out of Europe, the 3D standard, but fails to become an ISO standard out of the out of North America. Workstations and PCs came out. This is the 1980s. This is this is a long time ago. This is before we had personal computers. Now we have personal computers at this time. So now computer graphics really has to change a lot at this point because what happened? We don't have we didn't up to this time we never had any monitors for consumer electronic products. And monitors were almost a thousand dollars for a monitor. It was expensive. 
extremely expensive. Actually, computers were like two grand for a desktop computer that was an 8088. Small little process. I mean, small little processor. No memory, no hard drive. And you're paying like $2,000 for it. So anyway, I graduated from high school in 1983. And I got my first computer in 78. And it was an IBM PC Junior after an Apple IIe's. So I had two Apples and a PC Junior. And uh, we were from, you know, I wouldn't say affluent, but definitely uh, grew up in Las Gatas, Saratoga area. So for this particular area, we were one of the kids who had a little bit more money, I guess, in terms of their parents. My parents were okay, but just my parents, not me. <laughs> but no, it was unheard of. Like, you have what? So you just bring him friends to the friends to the house. Hey, look, I got a computer. What? <laughs> what is that? And I remember it was like two thousand dollars, and then because it, oh, don't you dare come close to that with your soda, you know. <laughs> you know, it was like under lock and key. This computer, I mean, it was like three thousand dollar investment. It's like buying a car. <laughs> anyway, long story short, it uh, it was great for playing video games. It didn't learn anything. Well, it learned basic, but then it didn't take me till like uh, after I graduated with my bachelor's degree before I even got into computer science, because I have my bachelor's in business. So, yeah, I didn't even study, com they didn't have computer science. <laughs> we didn't have a computer science degree when I went to college. But by the time I got to the master's level, then we had a computer science degree. It's like, great. So it was like a little bit before my time, I guess. Anyway, long story short, back to the <coughs> cost of, and that's the cost associated with real cost, <laughs> not necessarily efficiency, because that thing you had to put disks in. So now I wish I saved it because I, I, there are like museum pieces <laughs> we threw that sucker away. So. Some of the other people, though, they took the they took the, the CRTs. You could take out the insides of them. They were really nice casings, and you make fish tanks out of them. <laughs> Seriously, they're nice little fish tanks. <coughs> some some of them were and door stops. How many hands door stops? Three a thousand dollar door stop. Okay, so let's go back to boring stuff. Raster graphics. So the image is produced as an array which is the raster, of picture elements or pixels that are in the frame buffer. All right, so in here, if you look close enough, you could possibly see boxes. Uh, you kinda, this is the part here you're going to see. I don't know, it's hard. To, actually, you can see it better on here than I can on my computer. See, my computer screen is trying to take those boxes and push them together. It's much which is what computer graphics is trying to do and there's there's algorithms that go through your that go through the frame buffer and make it smooth so on my so this is actually I wish you could see my computer actually see on here you can see the boxes I can't see it I can't see it well I can see it a little bit if I look hard enough but it's harder to detect because my screen is compensating for me there's an algorithm back there that's correcting it so it's not correcting it on there though <laughs> Which is kind of weird, but this is going through a different. This is going into my graphics card, but it's going out through a different. That projector is out to a different. In fact, that's a lower resolution, which may also have an effect on that. Higher resolution, more pixels per area, or per per inch, or per however they describe. There's a there's a calculation for it, but that is essentially holding information in terms of elements or pixels. It's in the frame buffer, and it's being populated. And this is just the cat's eye. This little piece of it, but you can kind of see if you can draw this and then shrink it into a, put it into a frame buffer and then populate it out. This is just one component. This is what it would look like, you know, if we increased the resolution and zoomed in on it. So their elements are pixels. Each one of the squares would be a pixel or a combination of pixels in this particular case. So, so raster graphics. Here we go with the polygon and the painting. You can kind of sort of see it in this picture now. Allows us to go from lines and wireframe images to filled polygons. So before when we looked at, see this is a different picture though. Well, okay. This is the, all these pictures aren't matching. <laughs> it's okay. For illustrative purposes, we can, we have, and this is different. Oh no, this is the same. This is the same wireframing model. Because we can see the lines going this way. Uh, long story short, we filled it in, and we filled the polygons in, and these are square polygons actually, with gray color. And, we, we've, and some of it is lighter in gray. So the more 
you make the pixels smaller or the polygons smaller, the more contrast we can get. This is a sharp, this is a really poor quality, low, le low level. Oh, wow, it's even lower level <laughs> on this picture over here. It doesn't look as bad on mine because mine has smoothed, it has um, shaded it, has smoothed it. So, which brings up another concept that I'm not going to talk about today, but I'll talk about a um, couple, well, probably not for another couple weeks, and talk about coloring. There's algorithms that provide the smoothness from the transition. So, it's like when you cut and paste and you stick stuff together, you're going to see a line. <laughs> picture A and picture B, <laughs> line. Well, there's algorithms that will smooth the transition between the two contrasting colors, but you can't see it. On this particular low quality display, this is sharp. Shouldn't that just look like a shine? And so we should have not, we shouldn't see the lines, is what I'm saying. If we don't have that many pixels, we're going to see the lines. So if you look at, and unfortunately, maybe, you know, actually it's probably on the market somewhere. You're probably going to buy it on Craigslist. You can buy a really, in fact, it's probably not worth it. Buy a really, really old monitor. <coughs> load it up and compare the two. What you're going to see is more like this on the old monitor. Because you're not going to see as many pixels in the resolution, which means you're going to see the line breaks in the, of the contrast. You're, going to, you're definitely going to notice this as a line. Raise the resolution on this. Add more polygons on the image, and it's going to look real, which means you're not going to see these fake little lines in it. So, but that's raster graphicking. It's essentially filling in, allows uh, for lines and wireframes to be filled in. So you fill it in. This is graphic, raster graphic, and we filled in the pieces. Um, we didn't paint this picture. This is a picture. This is a picture actually. It's gone the exact opposite. Take the picture and turn it into pixels and frames. So PCs and work, workstations, and this is modern day, by the way. This is today. Although we no longer make the distinction between workstations and PCs, historically they've evolved from different roots, actually. So the PC is what we're looking at today, personal computer. We don't call it PCs anymore. These are notebooks now. <laughs> so, why do they call them notebooks? Do we even put notes on them? I don't know. No, they were called laptops for a while. But who in the world is going to stick that in their lap? Some of them were bigger than your laps, actually. And they might make good seat cushions eventually. <laughs> so... Earlier workstations were characterized by network connections, client-server model, high, high level of interactivity. So the focus, and the reason why this is mentioned in here, is the focus of where technology is going in terms of these portable devices, and <coughs> laptop, notebook computers, et cetera, and so forth. No longer is the focus on, because we can only go as fast as our limitation, as our speed of our network. So in the old days, we weren't that fast the network was faster than the computer could communicate with. So then there was many years of spending time forgetting about the graphics, just work on getting that network connection to go faster, which is the heavy duty focus. And then the earlier PCs included frame buffer as part of the memory. Easy to change contents and create images. And then, uh, you know, modern day computers, they all work at the same speed. Actually, there was a time, I don't know if people remember, there was a time in which you selected a computer because of the speed of the system. You know, it had a faster processor CPU, or perhaps it had the 802.11, something that was higher than the last computer that you had, or it supported Ethernet. You now they all do the same thing. They're all computer appliances. You just go and you buy one and take it home and turn it on. <laughs> and they all have the same basic components. The difference now is the quality of the components. It's like, is it going to last you a week, or is it going to last you two years, kind of thing. So, And then what operating system does it have on it? And that's the other consideration. So. so computer graphics from the 1980s to the 1990s, realism comes to the computer graphics world. So here we have smooth shading. So this is the realism that comes in terms of the algorithms. And it's interesting, uh, it's shading. And you can see the shading. Actually, can you see the shading? So when we get to a certain point where you, these images are not going, you're not going to be able to tell the difference on here because of the way it's performing. You can see the shading on here. You can see the, you can see the shading, and it's smooth because you don't see the boxes and the lines. Well, there's an algorithm that's doing that for you, and the algorithm is the shading. And we're going to go through. 
You don't have to memorize or know anything about the algorithms, but you can essentially um, get a feel for what the capabilities are. Because when you go into some of the graphic programs, it'll give you a name. You know, what's that name mean? <laughs> so this class is going to give you the vocabulary for some of the menu items and some of those programs. Or to, you know, you want smooth something or other. Oh, what was that? You know, or pin light versus ambient versus something else kind of thing. Environment mapping. So we took a uh, an image. Well, this is actually an image as well. Environment slash image map mapping. Which there's a road and something else under here that we've mapped. Which image mapping essentially. Um, bump mapping gives us texture. It's a form of texture. So texture. Well, the bump mapping is a derivative of that. Where we've got the appearance of there being something on top of something that's not necessarily smooth. So. And these are some of the stuff we'll be going through uh, piece by piece in the course as well. So, from 1980 to 1990, also same generation, uh, special purpose hardware. This is where we came out with silicon graphics, uh, the ge geometry engine. So, the VLSI implementation of the graphics pipeline. So we, then we ended up coming through and saying, well, okay, we know what a CPU does. If you've studied an operating system, if you've taken operating systems, you know what the CPU is doing. It's, you know, scheduling those processes to run, um, scheduling time, allocating memory, controlling all that stuff. And people get smart and they say, what about improving the graphic pipe and actually creating a formal graphic pipeline? Because before what we were doing was taking a bunch of stuff and putting it into a buffer. <laughs> and then taking the stuff from the buffer and populating it out on a, on a display using, you know, technology, right? So now it's like, well, let's render it. And if we render it, and we come up with, a co with the concept of this pipeline. Then we can separate it out into stages, optimize each one of the stages, configure it so we can get real-time rendering. So what we can do is stick a DVD in and we take, take it for granted, but stick a DVD in and <laughs> press play. It's rendered. There's a rendering process that's taking all that information that's formed in data Processing it, putting it together, assembling the layers of the or, or the pixels or whatever process it happens to be doing, putting it, delivering it to a buffer, and then sending it to the output. So it's it's a it's think of it sort of like an assembly line that was created instead of a regular old read and write. In fact, that's how we speed up hardware access these days. So in the old days, we would read an entire file, write an entire file, read. Now we buffer. So we buffer I.O. We buffer I.O. for everything now, actually. So Industry-based standards. This is, still, this is still in technology that we're using today from the 1990s. So RenderMan, uh, P-H-I-G-S, can never pronounce that. Network graphics for the X Windows system. This is the pre-Windows, actually, human-computer interface. We had to come up with... Uh, graphic support for GUI interfaces at this time as well. This is about the 1990s. 1990s to 2000, pretty much everything stopped around 2000, believe it or not. Well, we're, we're getting ready for the next kind of milestone. Well, it's 2012, so, well, maybe we're past due by two years. Right? Because, okay, so graphics can only go to a certain point, but other technologies have picked up where graphics <coughs> is left off. So the mobile um, processing, the, site, the processor speeds, stuff like that has changed. Graphics is pretty much the same it has been from the 2000s. Um, animations changed a lot though. So Anyway, OpenGL as an API came out and is heavily used and it's the bottom, which is why we're going to look at OpenGL. We're going to study OpenGL a little bit as a concept. Because it is the foundation for every graphics package out there practically. So it's nice to know what, what you're looking at. A completely computer-generated feature-length movies like Toy Story are successful. Well, because we can make it real-looking. So everyone remembers that. New hardware capabilities. Texture mapping. Well, without texture mapping, it's hard to do Toy Story, actually. So you take a real picture of something, and you map it onto a wireframe, and then you can move it around. And voila, <laughs> you've got real. It's as real as you can get. So things are starting to look more real. They're no longer. They're partly computer-related images that were generated from computer computer APIs, <coughs> and yet they're partly picture-oriented. 
So this is where, and this is kind of, in the 1990s, the year 2000, is kind of like where film and computer kind of merged, where we have digital film, digital media, because we can take the movie, put it on the computer digitally, and then supplement it. So we can have an actor, and what was that, Roger Rabbit, which is the most interesting thing, but there's a, there's a part in Roger Rabbit that's actually kind of funny that uh, I have to find the video. It shows where a piece of the arm is missing. <laughs> There's a human that interacts with the rabbit, and I can't remember the details. of. There's one scene in particular that they left in there because you can't see it. You can't see it. You know, the, the eyes can't pick up the pixels. It can't pick up the frame, but the, the, frame, the frames per second. Your eyes are slower than the movie. But if you slow it down, change the speed, slow down the way that it's being rendered, you can see that one part of her arm is missing. <laughs> because they had something there and then they took it out and they forgot to put the arm back in. It's just a section of an arm. I have it saved somewhere. I have to go look for it. It's, they had it on YouTube for a while and then someone got upset and they pulled it off so I can't get it online anymore. But I have it saved. <laughs> you know, people don't like other people criticizing their work. You know, That's... You know, one of the downfalls of social media is uh, the downfalls of everything being available. Nothing secret anymore. So if you made a mistake, you know, or if you left something out accidentally. But, you know, you see that in movies all the time. You see that in video games all the time. Really bad quality video games. It's like, wait a minute, why was that black over there? The, the, the back room just turned black. And then it came back. Or the characters change, but they move. They jump from this place. To this, and like, well, how did you get over there? That's because they cut and pasted the, 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 or the graphics weren't done correctly. So there's errors in it. Anyway, so we had stuff like texture mapping, blending that came out, accumulation, stencil buffers. Um, these are all things that we're going to be uh, kind of looking at. Texture mapping, I have an entire lecture on that, actually. There's different ways to texture map, actually. So 2000 and above, photorealism, yep, mm -hmm. taking, uh, making uh, photos into wireframes and then taking those wireframes and animating them and doing all sorts of things. And it's not just for animation, it's also for altering the image. And we can take and uh, kind of reverse engineer something to change characteristics, which is, you know, what you're doing if you're touching something up, essentially. Graphic cards for PCs dominated the market, NVIDIA, ATI, mm. Radeon is actually not on the list here, 3D, 3D Labs. Uh, game boxes, game players determine the direction of the market. Actually, the gaming industry determined the direction of the market for the most part in the United States. Because um, the gaming community, in fact, the gaming community is still leading this effort because they're the ones who are needing the faster processing. Those are the ones who are actually using the graphics card in the rendering process. You as a consumer, you never touch anything with the graphics. <laughs> you know, to check emails, don't use the graphic card. And then we have computer graphic uh, routine in movie industry for Maya, Lightwave. It's a couple of examples. Came out in the year 2000 or above. Programmable pipelines. Okay, so I talked about a graphic pipeline where we put together an assembly line or a system and process everything through it. So that we can, if we assembly line it, we can get it done faster, and then we can store th certain things, and we can go back and do air correction. So a programmable <laughs> pipeline allows you to configure it to optimize it for your application or for your purpose. So you can, if you're doing error air detection or correction, you can go back through the line, stop, restart, um, buffer certain things, move things around, change the order of the pipeline, optimize it. Maybe you don't need certain things happening. Maybe there's no sound. You know, you don't need the audio being mixed in with the video. And there is a correlation between the two. <laughs> we know that when we see the old movies where the, you know, the, the, uh, the mouth moves, but the words don't come out, and the words move. Actually, even today, the DVDs, you, if, you burn, if you strip a DVD out, you get two tracks. You get the audio track and you get the video track. It's two separate, and they're both rendered separately. And simultaneously, so if you've got a bad pipeline or a bi pipeline that's not intended for video processing, forget it. <laughs> the words are never going to sync up correctly with the mouths because the video and the audio are running at two separate 
two separate rates or two separate speeds. All right, we have another simple little one next. It's only 22 slides. Don't worry. We'll get out by 3 o'clock. Don't worry. I don't keep us longer than two hours. If you missed the first week, the class is supposed to run until 3.45. Mm, ish. So um, usually at the beginning of the course, I cut you a little slack, and then we have to catch up when we get off topic or we get a little further in, and we have to cover midterm material. But in the beginning, we'll, we'll probably get around to 3 o'clock, so, or 3.15 at the latest. So. so lecture number two for today is the background of OpenGL, part one. Background. I've been talking a lot about OpenGL. I will continue to talk about OpenGL for the entire length of the course. So it's not a bad idea to familiarize ourselves with what it is we're talking about. In terms of, you do not have to program in this OpenGL. If you were, the last time I taught this class, it was to strictly computer science software engineering students, and we did programming. And what did we do? We used a language like C or C++, mostly C. And uh, you can do this in Visual C, you can do this in Dev C++. It doesn't really matter what dialect of C. Actually, it works in Java now, too. There's an API for Java that works on top of OpenGL. Or you can use native OpenGL. Actually, there are a couple of different ways of doing it in Java. What does it allow you to do? It allows you to write methods, functions, call functions, write methods, implement functionality that uses this library. OpenGL is just a library. A library of predefined functionality that's programmed into your application. Game developers write in OpenGL because um, you need to run the fun. It's a low-level function mm, programming. It's not. But it's not like assembly language low-level. It's it's C. It's it's a higher level. It's a fourth-generation kind of interface that you can use with it. But it's extendable, and there's different extensions on it. One extension in particular works with the iPhone. <laughs> so it's the graphic library on the iPhone or the iPad. Apple uses it extensively in that interface. So every time you see something graphically happen, it's OpenGL. Everything you see in Maya is OpenGL. Everything you see on most computer applications is a base here. So what is this? It's developed by the OpenGL API. It's open source, and which is why it's used in so many different higher level and Somebody actually asked me what API was, I think, last time. So for those people who missed that lecture, application programming interface <laughs> is what API stands for. It's an interface that allows you to run functionality, create calls to things, to create objects or to create um, things in your source code that are pre-written for you. So OpenGL writes it all for you. You have a higher level interface that says, give me a triangle. Okay, here's a triangle. So you say, new triangle, blah, 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 whatever, however you're writing your source code. But you don't have to define what a triangle is. OpenGL defines what the triangle is. <laughs> so you're using an API that's built on top of OpenGL, so you can say sphere, cone, rectangle. And you don't have to know what a rectangle is or a sphere. You just say, you know, call, give me one of these. And... So the OpenGL library gives it to you. This is how this is working. So it depends on the nature of the application as to what components and what features you're actually using. You have an OpenGL architecture. And it OpenGL as a state machine. It runs as a state machine, kind of like the state machine concept I mentioned before, meaning that it's an endless loop. The OpenGL engine starts and it renders. Because if you think about these concepts, and OpenGL is for graphics only, doesn't do anything else which is why you have to use a programming language with it to get your UI, to get your all the other features of your program. It only works with graphics. But the state machine is an endless loop that comes up and says paints an image and leaves the image up there. You can rotate the image. You can work with the image. Um, it depends on what you're doing, what kind of program you have. You also have, in OpenGL, the lower level non-Java version of it is function based. So we have functions, and then we have types and formats. And it's actually a simple programming interface compared to some other interfaces out there. OpenGL has got respect in the community. It also has widespread popular use because it's actually easy. <laughs> and you guys are like, well, your definition of easy might vary. But if you're a programmer, it's pretty easy. It's not too hard. 
Uh, for functions themselves, uh, function calls, <coughs> if you don't have a programming background, that's probably not going to make that much sense. So think of it as common functionality, running a function, calling a function. Types are data types normally, and referred to as a triangle would be a type, a square would be a type, kind of things. And formats, you know, give me a forward um, or a backward kind of rotation or something in terms of the format of the, of the code. So earlier history of APIs. Before we got to the uh, OpenGL, we actually kind of covered some of this stuff already. This is where we got the graphical kernel system from a 2D, but contained good work, good workstation model. Didn't work too well with the outside of the workstation environment. The core, both the 2D and the 3D, this is made in America, or uh, North America, um, adopted as ISO and later in ANSI st standard in the 1980s. So we actually have gone with a European standard. Uh, which is where that came out of. Not easily extendable. Actually, in the beginning, we gone that way. So we changed it, changed to pass, because this is not easily extendable to 3D. It was only 2D. <coughs> Far beyond the hardware development. So it hardware surpassed the capabilities, made it so it wasn't quite as effective. So obviously, progress continued in terms of finding a better solution. This was like, you know, way out in the 70s. So, And then we have Programmer's Hierarchical Graphics System, PHIGs. I don't know how to pronounce that. But you know, you don't ever really need to either because it's not really part of America, uh, part of modern day. It's still tech. This is very current, by the way, but it is still, it's from the old days, but it's still around. So you'll still see it and you'll go, oh, well. Hierarchical graphic system takes and breaks out the components. This is pre-OpenGL, by the way. So it breaks out things into, um, well, into the plane, but it, in terms of uh, components that make up other components, created hierarchy. So in computer graphics, especially in OpenGL, we have a hierarchy. We would have, an example, if I was talking about a robot, we would have the robot <laughs> as the main object. And then the robot's got arms and legs and a head and a neck and... Those would be subcomponents, and the more subcomponents you have of the robot, the more animation you can actually succeed. Because what you're doing is moving and rotating these components within the 3D sphere. So it's just a positioning. I mean, not not to totally break break this down into like, oh, there's no fun anymore in this. Animation is nothing more than breaking out an object into smaller pieces and repositioning those pieces in the 3D plane. Ta da animation. <laughs> you can have it move faster or slower or smoother or rough, you know, but that's pretty much the concept in terms of what we're applying, in terms of computer graphics, by the way. Animation may also have different definitions outside of computer graphics. Um, but the high entire hierarchy came out of this study, and this um, arose from the CAD community. Because what do we do with CAD? Well, we usually can contain three dimension broken out into pieces. So we have a toy. And the first thing you're going to do with a CAD drawing is break it out. And then you're going to make smaller components out of that sub, sub assemblies. And then sub assembly has a sub assembly. And that's your hierarchy. And then you can actually break that down to a parts list if you needed to. And CAD's actually kind of interesting because that's being used in a lot of automated uh, ERP systems. You take a CAD drawing, CAD output, shove it through the Enterprise resource planning and your supply chain can be actually uh, modified to optimize. So you can come up with more generic cross components. So you can use the same type of material between different products, or you can use the same type of component like um, hardware component, um, nails, I don't know, screws. I don't really use nails, screws, and <laughs> computers, but if you get, catch my drift, like maybe a uh, um, I don't know, conductor material. Anyway, you can customize it so that each one of them is sharing. So you can buy an economies of scale when you're building the products by looking and organizing it through the CAD. And then the CAD drawing is essentially going to break out those that hierarchy to a point where you can actually come up with a parts list, perhaps, from it. Which is kind of like where things are going right now with uh, slice between supply chain management and enterprise resource planning and kind of manufacturing all put into one and the automation that's occurring is optimizing those optimizing the, the production so, and starting from the CAD drawing 
uh, which is a total hierarchy in terms of the way I mentioned it. Uh, database model with uh, will retain the graphics structure. So yeah, put the graphics structure in a database. Well, this is the interesting thing. Is so I think uh, if you want to talk about buffering, if you want to think about the way buffering has evolved, we've gone from simple array structures into more complex database structures um, throughout the years. So an array is nothing more than a list. So we had raster, beginning of raster graphics, we had a list of items and it was stored in an array component. If you don't know anything about programming, don't worry about it. If you do, you'll, you'll appreciate the difference between the array and some of the linked list or the database implementations that have been recently applied to the concept. It allows for faster lookup, faster processing. An array is pretty slow. A list is pretty slow. So computer science students, they usually take like a data structures and then they also take like an algorithms course and you can learn the efficiency between these different things. And what ends up happening in computer graphics is throughout the years, those data structures have been optimized. <laughs> and the processing and the algorithm speed has been increased to the point where it's taken up some of the deficiencies in the hardware capabilities. So we're improving the hardware by making the software more effective. And it really is a software and a hardware combination that's going to give us a good pipeline. That's going to give us a good processing speed. So, all right. So an X Windows system came out. It was a DEC MIC effort. Do we still have DEC out there? I don't think they're around anymore. Uh, client server architecture with uh, graphics itself. PEC system that's not around. Combine the two. Not easy to use. All of the defects of each one of them actually. Uh, for the purposes of this course, by the way, you don't have to know the entire history and the timeline, the dates and stuff, because you're trying to bring it, at this point, usually students are wondering, how much of this stuff do I need to absorb? Absorb what you can. I don't ever ask you specific dates or specific names of certain technologies. You're not going to be graded or tested on the history. Although we might have a history-related assignment, is what I'm thinking about. So we'll allow you to do some research on a particular technology or something to give some sort of a comparison with it. So. SGI, still around. They are still around. They were in Sunnyvale. Actually. No, no, Mountain View, I think. And then they, that, that turned into a museum. I don't know where they are now. We still have SGI computers. They're SGI, nobody, well, some people have heard of them, some people haven't. The ones who haven't heard of them have never worked for a large company that uses mainframes or that uses big power horse computers. <laughs> SGI based processing systems. They made server systems and computer equipment that optimize the graphic processing. Because someone's got to edit that video. <laughs> Somebody's got to create the animation. That's a lot of data. That's a lot of processing. That's a huge memory requirement. So SGI computers were like $20,000 each or something. You know? They were networked together and they shared processing among a couple of different computers and it was optimized for serious like you can build Toy Story on an SGI system. I mean they were for serious graphic and video editing. Now we do video editing on our personal computers but back in the day we really needed specialized hardware for that. So it revolutionized the graphic workstation by implementing a pipeline in the hardware so the hardware, instead of using it from a software perspective, had the memory buffer chips, had all of the information and the configuration needed, so it ran faster and smoother, and you can actually edit a video. And Actually, if anyone's ever tried doing it, you probably have realized it takes, um, just to even copy a DVD, it takes you about an hour. <laughs> In uh, 1982, it would have been literally impossible to do. In about 1990, 95, 98, maybe three or four hours. For um, This is talking about personal computers. So we're looking at something that was literally impossible to do. And this is just copying a video. What about creating a video? What about taking film and digitizing it? reading it and translating it into electronic media, which we all take for granted right now, <laughs> but uh, that's because our hardware is creating it for us. And if you haven't noticed, we have digital cameras. They're not old cameras with the media translated into digital, which they were in originally. So the original media that came out of those cameras was translated and converted into electronic media. It wasn't captured that way. 
Now we capture it directly, which makes use of the hardware. But we didn't have flash media back then. We didn't have, we had tapes. First cameras had like real tapes. Very poor quality. And then the tape wears out. <laughs> And uh, then there's a translation. You took the tape and it read the tape and it translated the tape into the digital content, the ones and the zeros out of that. It's not stored in ones and zeros. So when we got rid of the tapes and the cassettes and the, we went into the flash concept, voila, we have the hardware working for us. So that's what Silicon Va Graphics did. That's what the SGI did with the graphic pipeline with the original supercomputer that came out to do this. It was process it faster so it didn't take forever and then make it digital to begin with. So it used the hardware to digitize instead of using software, instead of using algorithms and stuff like that. There's still algorithms and stuff that are controlling the hardware, but it's mostly hardware based. So to access the system, application programmers use a library called GL, which is optimized for the hardware. So with GL, it was relatively simple to program three-dimensional interactive applications. You know, simple for programmers. And then we had OpenGL. So GL was made by Silicon Graphics back when. The, and Silicon Graphics still we can still buy CGI computers. So you go to you go to LA, you go into any of those studios, it's all CGI or it's CGI-ish components using the same kind of hardware pipeline. Because you need that. You can't do it on a personal computer. <laughs> you can shoot your home video on a personal computer. You can't make a full featured length film with combined video and combined animation on a personal computer. It doesn't work. So, yeah, comes close these days, but doesn't do it justice. So, OpenGL, so the success of GL led to OpenGL in 1992, a platform independent of the API that was easy to use, hmm, close enough to the hardware to get excellent performance, focused on rendering, omitted windowing and input to avoid window de system dependencies. So the window concept, um, kind of, hmm, well I think I'm going to save the window concept because I need to talk about worlds and I need to talk about interfaces to graphic libraries. In a window system it's you paint a picture. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase that. In a programming language, you paint a screen as a UI and you come up with a representation of the program that you're putting in a window. It's Think of it more like an environment. You're sticking it on a screen inside of components that are supposed to be interrelated for, like, say, menuing or for graphic display of some sort. What this OpenGL does is it takes an object and there's no window. There is no UI, there's no screen, it's just an object. So the object can float between many different windows, many different screens, and you can nest it inside of things and move it around. It's not stuck. It's not like you, it's, um, if you had the capability of drawing a picture and then taking pieces of that picture and moving them into other pictures without having to draw them, <laughs> then there's no window. There's no, there's no environment limitation in terms of the concept. But that would be, like, I'd love to see that. That'd be a good magic trick, actually. In fact, that'd be make, make, make a nice animation. You know, draw a picture on, and then have the pieces of the picture come up and go on to other pictures out of context. Because usually when we, I'm talking about drawing something and then with a pencil, <laughs> or with paint, paint, painting a picture. Like that picture on the wall, it'd take the sun out of there and move it to another picture. Not only would that be psychologically weird, but that there's no window. It's windowless if that happens. So that's kind of the concept of how OpenGL works. We have pieces and components that just go wherever we want them to go. And they, we use them however we want to use them. It's not like painting a picture and having a static picture that's always staying that way which is what we get when we take a picture and we scan it into the computer. That's why I say that's not graphics. That's a picture <laughs> that you've made electronic that we're looking at. Can you take the picture apart and use something out of the picture? No, usually until you start making it into computer graphics. And then you end up in a situation where you can, I don't know what that noise is, take the picture apart and take the person <laughs> out of the picture, which we can do, actually. So I don't know if you've ever been, uh, if you've ever explored through, but there's, Picture mapping, 
that's being done right now where it takes and identifies components. Like I say, for example, um, you uh, put a picture up there on your Google account of uh, you and the Eiffel Tower. You know, you're standing there holding up the Eiffel Tower. It's the famous picture everybody takes. Everybody takes that picture. You know, the Leaning Tower. Okay. Everybody takes that picture, right? And I don't know. I'm not quoting this. I could be wrong. So, actually, it's kind of true. Everybody takes <laughs> pictures of the Eiffel Tower and people next to it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Google come out with a data mining algorithm that takes and scans similar pictures. <coughs> There's going to be a little bit of variance. You know, people are going to be standing closer, farther away. The angle shots are going to be. But you can pick up by looking at it from a computer graphics perspective. You can pick up the Eiffel Tower. It has particular characteristics to it that you can pick up. It's going to be a common component. And then you can come up with statistics and averages what years people go visit the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> or how many people have visited the Eiffel Tower. Or, you know, you know how, and come up, give me a list of people who have, you know, from all the data that's been around. So, did you have a question or no? Oh, okay, you can put your hand up. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I should not look at you because you're... <laughs> Stretching. Okay, anyway. So, long story short, that's become images, pictures. I hate to scare you, but it has become a source of information on the internet. Everyone loves to put pictures up there. Well, we've got tons of pictures. We can turn that into a graphic application. Not a graphic one, but a data mining one. I should say data mining by image, by applying computer graphics to the images extracting out the components, comparing and doing pattern matching with the components, with other components, and then you can learn a lot of things about the environment, what's going on. So, I don't know, long story short, it has applications beyond the picture. But to take the picture and just scan it in, or to take a digital picture and just, that's not really graphics, that's a picture. The graphics is more of the inner, you know, non-window kind of effect to it. All right, so we came out with OpenGL. Focus was on rendering, uh, omitted windowing. So then we had the OpenGL evolution that has occurred, controlled by the Architectural Review Board, the ARB. Uh, some members included Microsoft, NVIDIA, HP, 3D Labs, IBM, SGI. So all the big players in the graphics world have come together. And the reason why it's, it's not owned by anybody. It's shared among everybody. It's open source, actually. And because it is, we know we can get, no one's got a stake in it. No one's making any money off of it. So we can put all these companies in here. What have they done? They've tried to optimize it for their hardware. Because hardware and software work extremely close together. So we can put a bunch of companies together. And why not involve the graphic card company, NVIDIA? <coughs> NVIDIA, believe it or not, is still the leader. Has not been surpassed. So if you're looking, and no one buys computers for the graphic card anyway. Well, maybe they do. You know. um, relatively stable. Uh, present version is 2.0. It hasn't been around that long, I guess, but we're only on 2.0. Still 2.0. Um, the evolution reflects new hardware capabilities, more memory on computers, faster processes, 3D texture mapping, and uh, texture objects. There's been some extensions on it, and there's been some third-party libraries that have been added in with OpenGL. And tons of people have built programs on top of OpenGL, higher level APIs, like uh, Maya, as an example, written on OpenGL. Allows for platform specific features through extensions. This is what I'm talking about, it's extendable. So, platform specific, what does that mean? Well, you can optimize, so GL is made for SGI computers. You can, OpenGL has been optimized to work on SGI computers, you know, just, just natural. They, they were involved, they were involved with the development. HP UX systems have been optimized. <laughs> so OpenGL is optimized to work on those systems. So long story short, you don't buy generic hardware when you're doing computer graphics. You buy name brand hardware for specific reasons because they're going to give you the features and the optimization that's going to work well. It's not what I would call generic. It's still not even today. So if you're serious about computer graphics, you're going to go with uh, expensive equipment. <laughs> And it's not expensive because you just like to spend money on it. It's just that you can't buy imitation. You have to have a real SGI system, or you have to have a real NVIDIA card with a lot of memory on it and stuff like that. Why do you need that? Well, to make your job easier. You could wait seven or eight hours for your rendering to occur, or you can wait two hours. It's so your choice. Okay, so OpenGL libraries. So the libraries themselves, we have the core libraries. 
OpenGL32 on Windows, GL on most Linux Unix systems, uh, the lib GLA, which is a shared library, actually, that works on Linux and Unix. You don't need to know about different libraries, it's just exposure to it. OpenGL Utility Glue. Uh, it's a utility library, provides you with higher level extensions on the regular OpenGL functionality. So, provides functionality for OpenGL Core, but avoids having to rewrite code. Uh, let's see, links with windowing systems, OpenGX, uh, WGX. Glue is actually used on the iPhone platform, actually. So it's got, uh, in fact, there's another extension on that. So there's a different API that works on it that's integrated into the Xcode stuff, so. Which has an um, Objective-C interface. So OpenGL works with Objective-C as well. It's another language I forgot to mention. So C, C++, Objective-C. Probably works with C Sharp. I've never tried it. And Java. Languages, so Glut. Glut. OpenGL. Utility Toolkit. So it provides functionality common to all of the windowing systems. So open a window, get uh, input from the mouse or the keyboard, menu items, event driven, stuff like that. So GLUT is different from Glue. Glue is the utility. It <coughs> provides you with the graphic plane, the utilities for animation, <coughs> for movement, for all sorts of different characteristics. GLUT gives us the one of the user interface for the, how do we say it, <laughs> desktop computer applications. <laughs> so when you're building an application that's going to run on a computer, then you're going to use GLUT interface. So in GLUT interface, you can say, give me a new window. There's a window. Put these items in the window. Put them in the window. You know, it's, it's generally, you know, detect a mouse event. <laughs> so you're looking at stuff that you're not going to get, let's say, in a computer game. Uh, where you're not, don't have a mouse. I mean, do you have any windows in computer, in uh, Game Boys? You know, or I don't know what the, what's popular these days, but uh, the Wii. Actually, Wii have windows in them. There's some windows <laughs> in them. But. Anyway, long story short, the environment's different. This is made for PC computer applications. Code is portable, but lacks the functionality of a good tool set for a specific platform. No sidebars. Well, if you haven't noticed, applications are built for different platforms these days. This is one that's supposed to be working in a Windows environment for all platforms. So that would be like me trying to say, I can write one program, well, I can in Java, that works and looks like a Windows program. Never. <laughs> or that looks and look, works and looks like an Xcode Objective-C program. Never. So Java programs, if you haven't noticed, Java programs look like Java programs. Actually, they're looking better now. They're looking a lot better, but primitive in the beginning when you downloaded a Java program. If any of you have ever worked with NetBeans, that's a classic one. It has never changed. It's still looking like a Java program. You know, the window is kind of a gray color, <laughs> and the bar is a little thinner, and the, the motif is different. It doesn't look like Windows. Well, Windows comes from the Microsoft Foundation classes, MFC, which is used to describe... It's, it's Microsoft. When you say, give me a new window, and you're using the MFC libraries, it's going to give you a new window. It's going to look like all the windows. It's going to look like the notepad window and all the other windows that are on the system. And if I do the same thing on a MacBook, it's going to give me a Mac-looking Coca window, which is totally different library. It's a Coca interface. And if I do it on a portable device, it's going to use me Coca Touch. You know, So it's going to give me a different motif, a different look and feel. Well, that's the problem with OpenGL. You can't create a Windows application. It looks like a Windows. It looks like an OpenGL application, which is okay, but that's one of the downfalls that it has. There's no, there's no specific platform support. You know, that that did, however, it opened up the door. Well, because there's no specific platform, it's cross-platform compatible, then we have manufacturers who say, oh, no problem. I can build something on top of OpenGL. It works on Windows. And now we have libraries that are built on top of OpenGL that allow us to create programs for Windows. And then we have programs for the Mac and programs for the iPhone that are all built underneath the, uh, underneath the platform that provide the platform-specific implementation details. So here's our software organization. We have the application program on the top here. And then underneath we have the GLUT interface, which is going to give us our windowing. And then we have the GL maybe underneath it. And then we all have all the operating specific stuff, writing underneath the OpenGL motif, 
and the widgets or similar motifs that might be on there. Uh, motif? I guess familiar with that word? Yeah. It's like a, well, because you're international students, I sometimes wonder which words I should use and not use. Motif! 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 I can't even say it right. Motif. <laughs> the F bothers me. It's the look and feel. It's the characteristic. So, it's the motif. Windows motif. It's the the blue line. It's the it describes the characteristics of how the window looks versus a coca motif, which is uh, different. Now, if I if I pulled up an application on both systems, on both operating systems, the motifs are different. I'm sorry. The whole theme is different, but the motif actually here. A window motif. I've got a few minutes. See how this window looks? It's got like a. It doesn't look the same. This is a different. This is a coca motif. <laughs> it's like a, a look, like an appearance. It's like an appearance. The window motif is so. In Linux, you can select different motifs, so this can look different. The, this this window can look different. Uh, OpenGL has its own, which is non-standard. Java has its own. If you look at the screen classes and stuff, the JFrame, all that stuff, doesn't look like Windows. Doesn't look like the Mac either. The motif is different. So, the motif is separate than the implementation. What was that slide number ten? We're getting there. We got like fifteen minutes left. <laughs> also, gave me an opportunity to check the time. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's what's referred to. Open GL motif are the widgets. The widgets are, you guys know what widgets are? Components. Widgets. So, what was that? There was another word that came out. It was a slang word, but not widget. It was a, to describe, a, like, do you remember the pet rock? You ever heard of the pet rock? Oh, this is fun. Usually at the beginning of the class, all the newbies coming in here. Pet rock! Some brilliant American took, went outside, grabbed some rocks from the ground, washed them off, painted them, put them in a box and called it a pet rock. And people bought them by the dozens. <laughs> Americans bought them by the dozens. I don't know if they ever made it into the international market. You guys have never heard of the pet rocks. No. So, it was a great concept. Usually, People have pets, you know, their dogs, cats, fish. Why don't they have a rock? You give it a name. It's like the cat. You guys heard Cabbage Patch dolls? Same concept, but similar. Ca cabbage Patch dolls? Nobody in this room has heard of them? So you took a, you know, dolls. Little girls usually like to, <laughs> like to play with dolls. You know, they're toy made out of plastic. You know, baby dolls. Well, they gave them birth certificates and they gave them characteristics to match the family so you can buy an African American doll, a Chinese doll, an American doll, a Japanese doll, all these dolls, right? With names, Indian doll. <laughs> I don't know if they had Indian dolls, I don't know. It wasn't big in the Indian market, I guess. <laughs> they call it Cabbage Patch dolls. It was a brand name, Cabbage Patch, right? Because it came from the Cabbage Patch. I don't know. I don't know if they were made out of cabbage, but anyway. <laughs> they had birth certificates. They came in a nice little box. People left them in the box. And they had names. Like each one of them had a unique name. And they sold by the dozens. It's kind of like the pet rock. All the ro Some of the rocks weren't even painted. You just take some rocks, throw them in a box, and sell it. <laughs> Great product idea. Well, it's kind of like the, uh, there's another thing that's still in the market. Okay, so no more Cabbage Patch, nothing. No more Pet Rocks anymore. Remember the little Chia Pet? There's still, you guys know Chia Pet? Oh, no. <laughs> Chia. Don't ask me what it's made out of, but I think it's like a ceramic uh, porcelain slash, it's like a red, red rock. I can't remember what it's called. It's like a, okay, they look, the original Chia Pet looked like a little baby dog, like a, 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 a structure that looked like a dog. It's a bitsy small, you know, like, I don't know, a, you know, fits in the palm of your hand kind of Chia Pet. And you watered it, and it grew. And I think it was growing sprouts or something. They put something inside of it, and, 
Huh? It grew as ha the hair. <laughs> it came out a little. Whatever was inside of it growing, I still don't know what it is. Someone can probably correct me on that. But you watered the thing. Well, inside it's a plant. It, inside there's a plant that's growing, and the plant grows out through the holes of the of the dog thing. It has little holes in it, and it grows. It looks like hair, and then you cut the chia pet. Shave the chip. Another invention. It's still around there. In late night television, if you're ever bored, flip around. You see chia pet commercials. And sometimes you see them in like Walgreens or something. Never made it into the international market, I guess. But anyway, I, that's a good thing. Well, I just actually, it's not a bad idea to end at this point. Actually, <laughs> no, I was talking about chia pets. I think I'm done with computer graphics. So I'll let you guys go early today because uh, it's still the first couple weeks or so. But uh, actually, not really, because we have to do attendance, which is going to take about 15 minutes. So. I'll end the video unless we have any questions at all. Don't ask me about Chia Pets. I don't know anything about them. I've never owned a Chia Pet. I did own a Pet Rock. I did not own... A Pet Rock was given to me as a birthday gift. I went... Oh, yeah. Another popular thing, buying stars. You can still buy stars, by the way. Stars in the sky. Here, let me stop this video because people don't need to hear this.